Okay. Um, so today we are going to keep talking about keep uh, with the unit on power systems, talking about AC and uh, DC and AC circuits, and then we'll also talk some about AC power. Um, and, and at the end, we're also going to talk a little bit, I'll leave some time at the end to talk about the class project, which I've posted the guidelines for, um, as well as the deadlines for, and then the homework. I'll hand it back, <coughs> the homework from, that was due last time. Okay, so uh, first of all, were there any questions from last time? Oh, and, and also the solutions are posted. Uh, the should not be visible from the, um, so make hopefully, that's not visible from that. I should check to make sure that's the case. But yeah. should not be visible for that because I, I, I don't want to you know, have them too publicly available, the solutions. But um, that's, a, that's a login for the solutions. You can log on to the website and get them, get them there. Um, you log in when you click the, the link to the actual solutions themselves. Um, so was there any questions from last time to start off with? We started talking about simple DC circuits. Um, and then we're going to keep going with that today. All right, and I will try to end, you know, five, ten or fifteen minutes early to talk about both the homework I'm giving back and then also the uh, the class project. All right, so the the point I introduced a couple elements last time: you have voltage sources, current sources, um, good the ground, resistors, this kind of stuff, and. The definition of what we're going to do in, in, in these circuits is something called linear circuit analysis. And the idea there is that we call it linear circuit analysis when you can solve these set of equations, or rather when you can relate the current and voltage in a circuit via a set of linear equations. Now in general, these will be matrix equations. So these will be actually sequences, vectors of voltages and vectors of currents and they will be related by some linear matrix. And sometimes you know some of these and, you know, and sometimes you know other ones of these elements, but the goal of linear circuit analysis is usually to solve the unknown ones given the known ones. Now, we're not actually going to talk too much about sort of how you build these matrices because it's a little bit involved and if you've taken an EE, intro to EE course, you've done this before as well. Um, you spent a lot of time doing it, in fact. So, so we're, we're going to ignore that, all that for this class for the most part. Um, but we will see some examples of a few things. We'll see some examples of sort of simple cases that you should, you should know about. And then also we'll talk about software you can use to actually solve this in practice. Um, because actually for linear circuits, there, there exists really, really mature software that can solve all these things for you. You just type in the description of the circuit or click it in if, if you use a graphical interface and it will give you the solution uh, of, of, of what you want. So we'll use some of that for this course because knowing how to use those things is valuable. Um, but we're not going to talk too much about sort of how you set up these equations, except in the one special case for, for power flow, which is large scale transmission uh, distribution systems that, that we will define those. There's simple rules for that one. Um, okay, so <clears throat> this is sort of a, a broad statement of what linear circuit analysis is. But in the context of DC circuits, let's talk now about uh, some simple rules for resistors. So, right, so I showed a a, a graph here, or <laughs> a circuit diagram here before. Get one of these long, I can point with this guy here. I showed the, the, the circuit diagram here. Um, and one question you might want to ask for this, is given the setup is, for example, what is the current flowing through that wire? Um, and for simple things like this, there's actually some very easy rules that you pr probably are all very familiar with that tells you how things like resistors uh, can combine when you play some different configurations. So the two rules that you're probably familiar with are, rules for resistors in series. So if you have two resistors you place in series, that is effectively one resistor with the resistance of the, each one just added up. Um, it makes sense, right? Because basically it has to go, you know, the, the electricity current has to pass through one and then the other, so they, they add up. Um, when you ha have res resistors in parallel, so this is a configuration like this where you have two that are in parallel like that, um, in this case, you have a different rule for how they combine. And what happens is the resistance of the total thing is equal to 1 over the resistance of each, 1 over 1 over the sum of the resistances. So you take the inverse resistances, add those, and take the inverse of that. Um, the way to sort of, first of all, think about this intuitively, one thing that you, you can think of is when you have a situation like this, when you put two resistors like this in, in series, 
the total resistance should really increase, right? Because you're at, you have to go through more things. Um, in this case, it should decrease, right? Because you've sort of given electricity two paths it can go through. That should somehow be less resistance than each one on its own. Uh, and these rules do bear that out. So if you, you plug in numbers here, you will get the fact that this is going to be less than each one of these. Um, but another way to think about this is if you think of the inverse of resistance, there's a quantity called conductance. I won't um, say too much about these names because there's a million of these names. Uh, sometimes I even forget them. Uh, essentially for magnetism, there's like a thousand different names, right? I never remember those ones. Um, but, but you can think of the inverse of resistance as something called conductance. And the, what this is really saying is that because the total resistance is, you know, the inverse of this total resistance is the conductance, what this is saying is the conductances of resistors in parallel, those add, right? So, um, boy, what letter do you use for conductance? I can't even remember, because C is capacitance. Anyway, I'll, I'll use C here, even though you shouldn't do that. So if, if, if I said something like C equals 1 over R, uh, and C2 equals 1 over R2, then C of the total thing would just be C1 plus C2, right? Because this would be the inverse of this total thing, and this would be the inverses of each one. So that's sort of a simple way to remember this in case, in case you do forget, but you probably are pretty familiar with this rule as well. Uh, and the reality is we're not going to really use these too much. You just should be familiar with these, with these basic things. Um, so I'm not going to use C again anymore because uh, we're going to use it for capacitance from now on. Um, so given these rules, natural questions, given a circuit like this, uh, how can I compute how much current is flowing through that point there, marked I1. Uh, does anyone want to just say how you do this? So first of all, what's the resistance, effective resistance of this little parallel resistors there? Three right. Um, so you have one here, which is 10 ohms. Uh, and you can think of these, both these two things, I won't draw that out like this because it's on the board, but you can think of them as actually effectively being one resistor, where the resistance there is one over the inverse of those things. So it would be, uh, R here would be one over, one over two plus one over four, which is equal to four thirds, right? Um, so then now, we're going to use our next rule and say the resistors in series add. Uh, so the total resistance of this whole thing, you can think of this whole thing now as just one big resistor. Where this is, um, <laughs> I should probably just use not, not use fractions, but it's 10 plus 3 4, so that's going to be 34 over 3. Um, sorry, 10 plus 4 thirds. And now we have a 5 volt source here. So what is the current flowing over this thing? What was that? Yeah. So it's, it's going to be voltage over resistance, right? So you have 15 over 34. I should probably come up with a number. Oh, that's an example, it has a nicer numbers, but whatever. Um, OK, so that's, that's kind of easy, right? We applied our rules. We're all set. Um, but it turns out that it's actually, and, and let me, before I actually say these next two things, uh, let me just skip ahead a few slides, actually, and just say, what about this? Um, this now seems harder, right? Because there's a lot of sort of paths electricity can flow. Uh, how do you actually do this? It's not just like you can reduce it to simple rules like we did before. Um, so. There's actually two more laws, you actually only need to use one, of, one or the other, um, that you can also use to help in how you analyze circuits. And we should know these. Uh, we're not going to, as I said, sort of apply these to actually get those matrices for those nasty things. We're just going to trust computer code that can do this. Um, but these two laws are very important to know, and they're Kirchhoff's voltage law and Kirchhoff's current law. Um, and these are both, they're very intuitive, um, but it, what, what the voltage law says is that if you measure the voltage drops around any closed circuit in a closed loop in a circuit, I should say, um, 
these voltage drops have to sum to zero. Right? Which kind of makes sense because you have to, I mean, if, if you have a battery here and this is 5 volts, then, you know, this has to also be a 5 volt voltage drop here. And you can do the same thing for any loop in the, in the circuit. It has, the voltage differences have to add to sum to zero. Now, remember, voltage is a uh, property we actually measure in two spots. So what we're really doing here is we're measuring the voltage drop there and there, above and below above and below the uh, voltage source, and above and below this resistor, and above and below that resistor. And it's also important to take these in the right, uh, get the right sign for all these things, right? So one of these, the convention is you'll always do it in the same order. So you, know, you measure there versus there, and then there versus there, and then there versus there. Uh, one of these will be negative by that convention, and one of them will be, po uh, two of them will be negative, and one will be positive, or, or vice versa. Let's make sure you get the signs right, but intuitively it makes sense, right? You sort of, you have to, sum to zero here, or he'd sort of be, it would, yeah, he'd be creating voltage somehow. It, 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 wouldn't, it wouldn't sort of, there would be no balance to the circuit otherwise. Um, the next one is Kirchhoff's current law. Uh, there's also, a val uh, people will often just say KVL or KCL for these things. Uh, but this, what, what this says is that the current entering and exiting any node in a, in, in, in a circuit has to always also sum to zero. So voltage, remember, is a property of difference of points, of two points. Current, on the other hand, is just a property of a, of a single point in a circuit. And what this law says is that if you look at any point in a network, so it's typically applied to sort of branching points, but it can really be any point you want, um, the amount of current entering has to be the amount of current leaving. And this is also very intuitive, right? Because otherwise there'd be some sort of magic current that was going somewhere that wouldn't be accounted for at all. Um, so in this case, and, and again, here the signs matter. Uh, so I'm, I'm actually kind of building the signs into this here. So what I'm saying is that I1 is the current flowing into that, and I2 is the current flowing away. Uh, so I'm saying I1 minus I2 minus I3 equals zero. If they were all pointed in, for example, then you would just be adding these up and the sum of these would be equal to zero. But typically because current has a direction, we always just go with the, 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 the direction of current flow. Again, it's, the actual direction is arbitrary here, but we say current flow from positive to negative. Um, okay, so those are, the two, those are the two laws. And now, sort of taking my word for it, if you haven't seen this before, but it's really not too hard. Um, Using those, those two laws, plus Ohm's law, you can actually solve any circuit like this. With, I'll, I'll talk, for, for now, we'll think about DC circuits. So you can solve any DC circuit for now, we'll say. Um, the same applies to AC, actually, but it's a little different, as we'll see in a second. Um, you can solve any, any DC circuit by just repeated application of Kirchhoff's laws and Ohm's law. And what you actually do is you set up a big matrix equation, and then you find the inverse of it, and that ends up giving you the quantities you want. Uh, that's typically how, they, how these things actually work. Um, so the, here's an example, right? Uh, it's not trivial here to just apply the, you know, parallel, resistance in parallel, resistance in series to figure out what's happening here. Um, because this whole thing is one big effective resistor, but, you know, it's not like it's just ones in parallel or just ones in series. It's kind of hard to actually see. So, you can figure out exactly what's happening here, figure out the effective resistance just through KVL and KCL and then Ohm's law, um, but we're not gonna do it that way. What we're gonna do, and what I'll introduce now, is um, some computer programs that solve this for you. So let me start up one. And you'll use this a little bit on the homework. Okay, uh, let me bring this over. It's sort of hard to see, huh? Let me expand it. Okay, um, actually this is a bad idea. Let me mirror my display instead. Otherwise I'll be constantly looking over my shoulder. So um, can everyone kind of read that? It's going to be kind of hard to see from the 
video, I imagine, but you can play around with it yourself and hopefully it'll be somewhat obvious what I'm doing. Um, this is a software called Quux. Q-U-C-S. And we'll use it for the homework. Um, you just, I think it's quux.sourceforge.net, but I actually am blanking on that right now. If someone has a laptop, you can check to see if that's right. Um, I think it's this quux.sourceforge.net is, is where you download it. But um, this is a, it's, this is a, a gra uh, circuit simulator that has a nice, kind of nice graphical interface and it's a free one. Uh, is, is that right? That's the, yeah. Okay. So, so um, the website to get it from, and this, this, this will be in the homework when you use it too, but. Um, This is, uh, Quux stands for the Quite Universal Circuit Simulator. Um, and essentially it's a, it's a program that lets you lay out circuits in, in the graphical manner and then solve for what's going on. Um, so we're gonna use it some in class. And, and the point really isn't to become uh, sort of an expert at this one program because there's a lot of different programs. You may have heard of SPICE too. If, 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 if any of you have done this kind of stuff, SPICE is another very popular circuit simulator program. Um, Quux is, is sort of easy, it has a built-in graphical interface and it's free, so I'm going to use it for this course. Um, but there's a lot of these things and they all work pretty much the same way. They're very mature technology at this point. They, and, and they go well beyond this kind of stuff we're going to do in this class too. Um, but what that lets you do here is it lets you essentially lay out circuit components and then s you know, insert probes, just like you would with a real circuit board, um, but you don't have to actually you know, build things and get a voltage source and all that kind of stuff. You can just simulate stuff. Um, and for these things, this is going to be very accurate, this kind of simulation. These, these laws are, are, are very, very well understood. So what we do uh, to build a circuit here is you just place the components on this little simulated circuit board here. Um, the interface is a little bit weird in this Mac version. If you have a Windows or a Linux machine, it'll be a little different. I think you just have a drop-down menu instead of this weird sideways tabs here, but I guess whatever. Um, so you, you, what you first do is you place a bunch of these components. Um, and so you can select different components. Uh, and so let's place, for example, a voltage source um, somewhere in our figure. And let's actually try to create this, uh, let's try to create this circuit here. So um, actually, I, I know what it looks like. So let me just place it. Okay, so I'm going to add some resistors. Um, I'm just going to throw them down, ignoring, oops. Ignoring their uh, resistance values for now. You, you click the um, right click to rotate things just as a, as a quick way of speeding it up. And then there, okay. That should be all the, the resistors we need. Uh, and now I'm going to draw wires to connect them all. So this little tool up here is the wire ones. Uh, I, I don't know, somehow in the Mac version they somehow messed up the tracking here so it doesn't actually place this, this weird thing supposed to follow the mouse. It does in the Windows versions, but uh, this is the, the, the joy of, of using open source software, I guess. Uh, okay, so let's, let's draw some wires now. Connect these things as we were, as they are wired up. I won't do this too often, but it's sort of good to see the whole process one time. Um, Okay, I'm also going to put a ground. Ground's also in this select down of lumped components here. Uh, just to, it typically runs better as a whole when you put a ground in this, this simulation. So if, if things are going weird, just put a ground in. Um, other things, otherwise strange things can happen. Can everyone read that? It is pretty small, isn't it? I wonder if I can zoom in. Um, it's probably a little better, huh? There we go. Okay, um, so now what we're going to do is we're going to just set the resistors to be the right values. So I guess it's 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3. So this is 1. Oops, thank you. <laughs> All right, um, get rid of that. Okay, so 1 ohm, 1 ohm, 1 ohm. These were 2. 
and two. All right, and now we have our circuit laid out. Oh, and I guess the voltage source we had was how much? It was five volts too. Okay. It was actually three ohms. Right. Oh, it was three ohms. Yeah. Not that it really matters. <laughs> Uh, I don't even have the answer on the, on the slide. So, okay, so now we've laid out the basic circuit here. Uh, and now we want to actually simulate it. And to do this, there's a couple things you need to do. The first thing you want to do is uh, place some probes to actually get the quantities you, wanna, you want to, to get. Um, and so we're going to do that with, so on the drop down here, there's also a, a setting for probes. Um, and it's just a current probe and a voltage probe. So let's insert a current probe here. Um, that will measure the current through that line. The other thing is when you do this, make sure to check the current is actually, the probe is actually connected. Oftentimes you'll just put a probe that's just sitting on top of a wire that is not actually connected and then you know, won't get anything and you'll be confused. Um, so just make sure it's connected when you do that. Um, and now what you do is you, you have to go through a little bit of a, of a dance here, but it's not too hard either. You also in this thing, you go to the simulations drop down and place a DC simulation. And that's really all you do. You just leave it there and place a DC simulation. And that will actually tell the program that you want to simulate the steady state DC current and voltage for this circuit here. Um, you can also do things like AC simulation, which we'll see in a second, which will s simulate AC, uh, steady state voltage and current. And you can do things like transient simulation, where you actually look you know, time, time point by time point what happens. And that we'll actually talk about when we talk about nonlinear circuits. We'll cover a little bit of that. So, now you click this little, so now everything's good. I think you have to actually save it to, um, so this is just test circuit. To save it to actually get anything to work here. Um, and you can now simulate. And it's great, it ran the simulation. Of course, you don't get anything yet. Um, and it's a way to actually get results. You'll, you, you'll want to do things like, like show a Cartesian plot um, or a tabular plot so that we'll put on a tabular plot. And here you can just select things like the value of this probe. I'll add this. I'll add that to there. And so then uh, what you will see is you will see a display with this PR1.I, which is the current passing through that current probe. So the answer there was 1.88. <laughs> So, you know, that's, that's essentially how this works. You'll get a little more familiar with it. And, and it's actually very, very nice for testing out some things, um, especially when you do things like circuit design with nonlinear components. Uh, it can be very, very nice to, to stimulate things first, you know, before you put in things like diodes and, 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 and transformers and all that kind of stuff onto a, I haven't talked about that yet, so don't, don't worry about what I'm saying right there. But um, it can be very nice to sort of get some idea of what's going to happen with these systems before you actually plug everything in um, and, and you know, have everything blow up or not. So we're going to use this in the homework. Uh, and you'll, you'll want to download it and become a little bit familiar with it. Uh, but the description, as I say, is in, is in the next homework, which is posted right now. Did I mention that too? The next homework is posted? OK, next homework is posted today. Um, it's due in two weeks from today. Uh, I'll, I'll discuss this all at the end of class when I talk about the current homework and the next homework, et cetera. Okay, so, so that, that's great. So we have this, this software now that can simulate circuits, can give us, tell us the answers that we're looking for for circuits. Um, and let's see what to do. Well, that's, that, as I said, is going to be kind of the, um, the extent to which we actually do complicated circuit analysis. If you want, you can try to, you know, on the homework, when you have questions like this, you can write down the equations in, in matrix form, but you're not required to. All right, so let's switch gears now and go from talking about DC circuits to AC circuits, alternating current circuits. Um, who here has done, has studied AC circuits before? Okay, so about half. Um, so this is a little bit, intuitively, it seems a lot harder. Because what AC is, is AC goes from having voltage sources which are a constant uh, source, you know, constant amount of voltage, so there's always, you know, plus five and minus five, or rather just a different, a voltage drop of five volts over, uh, over the terminals of a battery or something like that. AC circuits are ones where the actual voltage varies sinusoidally over time. So the, the, the definition um, that we'll be using is VT 
And we'll use little v in this t to indicate when we're talking about kind of a, a function that will vary with time. As, I will, as we will see in a second, we will actually typically drop that, those, sub, those, uh, those sort of notation when we're talking about AC circuits because we don't actually need it, sort of amazingly enough. Um, you can do all the same analysis as you were doing before for steady state analysis. Um, but, but this is the actual form of the, of the function here. It says the voltage varies with time um, according to, well, there's some V max term. That's sort of the, the maximum scaling of the voltage times the sine. And actually, I'm writing sine here because people think of, when you say sinusoidally varying current, people think of sine. But it could be cosine too, right? It doesn't actually matter. Um, it just gives a different offset. So you know, it doesn't matter if it's a sine or a cosine. In fact, later on we'll use notation where that actually implicitly will be a cosine, but don't, don't really worry about that. So the voltage at time t is equal to the Vmax times the sine of omega t plus phi. Omega here is the frequency. Uh, t is assumed to be in seconds. And so omega t says essentially how fast is this current actually uh, alternating through one cycle of current. So for example, if omega is equal to 60 times 2 pi, um, you may see conventions where people pull out the 2 pi outside here or not. I'm just going to put, put the 2 pi inside the frequency itself just for, for convention. Um, what this would be saying is that the voltage here will do a complete cycle. This complete cycle, remember, would be 2 pi. So essentially when t is, if, if it was just like this, then when t was 0, you'd be here. When t was 1, you'd be here. Right? That was, omega was just 1 times 2 pi. And so if we make it 60 times 2 pi, what that, and, and, and this axis on t is always, as I said, in seconds. So t here is, is in seconds. Um, and what this says is that the current will do, so the voltage will do a complete cycle like this 60 times a second. And then the US is actually what is happening on outlets. So if you put, we'll put, to put a, a voltage probe onto an outlet, which you would actually see, and an oscilloscope really, onto an outlet, what you would actually see is it varying, going up and down 60 times a second, like this. In fact, we'll, we'll see that later in this course. Um, the other component of this is something called, called phi here, which is the phase angle. And again, I sort of apologize for all this, that we're going to use notation in very different ways than we did in the machine learning section. This is just sort of the reality, is that people use different or the same symbols <laughs> in fields that are traditionally not at all talking to each other. So, so we're going to have different, different uh, uses of notation like this. Phi here denotes the, the phase angle which is essentially just how offset this is from crossing zero like this at time zero. And this is very, for, for a single AC source, if all you have is a single AC voltage source, it's completely arbitrary because it doesn't really matter what time it's going. What really ends up mattering is when you have things like voltage and current that are both AC waveforms, what matters in some sense is the difference between these two things. So, so what the relative phase angle is between these two different sine waves. Um, and we'll see that a lot actually shortly about what different components do to this, to this, to this phase angle. Um, so, so, you know, for a single thing it doesn't really matter, but for, for many, uh, when you have different sine waves, the relative phase angle between them matters a lot. And so for that reason we'll actually typically assume that the, you know, the main voltage source in a circuit, for example, has zero phase angle. And we'll just fix it at zero, and then what matters is sort of how other ones, how other sinusoids are related to that one phase angle. Uh, now there are two conventions for reporting the magnitude of a voltage signal like that. All right, so the first one would be to just report V max. Just say that that's, that's the maximum voltage that it ever hits. Um, so we're just going to report that. Um, but this is actually not the most common. So you may have heard that voltage in the United States, for example, is 120 volts nominally when you, when, 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 you know, on an outlet will have 120 volts on its AC. Um, they do not actually mean it has a peak voltage of 120. What they actually describe is something called uh, the root mean squared voltage. 
And what this is, is this is the integral of the voltage squared, or rather, sorry, the, yeah, the voltage squared times the, the, the sine squared, so this whole quantity squared, over this time period. And I'm writing it here, I'm, I'm sort of leaving out uh, omega and t here because uh, we're integrating from 0 to pi, so we're you know, implicitly having omega be, be 1 there. It doesn't matter what it actually is, it doesn't, the point is it doesn't actually change the, the, the voltage magnitude, what omega is. And similarly, phi does not affect the voltage magnitude at all, or the size of the voltage, so we just assume this is 0 and assume this is 1. And then we essentially take the, the integral from 0 to 2 pi of this, of this voltage squared, and we divide by 2 pi to get kind of the, the, the mean uh, squared voltage, then we take the square root of that. Um, for a sine wave, that actually ends up just being 1 over square root of 2 times the voltage max. Uh, but this is what we're actually is being reported when we talk about 120. Uh, voltage in the U.S. goes to about 177 as its max voltage, uh, and it's 120, which is this factor here, is what, is what we report. Um, now you might say, why do we do this? Why is this being used? Um, it has to do with if you. I'm going to say this. Don't worry about this if you if, if it doesn't immediately click for you, but this is sort of one of the reasons. If you were to put a resistor on an AC circuit like this, and we'll see what this happens in a second. As you imagine, you know, the, the, the current goes with the voltage, but it goes in different magnitudes depending on the actual, um, depending on the actual size of the voltage. Um, if you were to put a resistor on an AC circuit and put one on a DC circuit, um, they would burn the same amount, I think it's burn, they would use the same amount of power, where power is the voltage times the current, and we'll talk about what power means in the AC sense, but they would use the same amount of power when the DC voltage and the AC root mean squared voltage are the same. So a, if you put a resistor on 120 volts root mean uh, AC, that would take up the same amount of power as if you put the same resistor on 120 volt DC circuit. Um, and we'll see why that is exactly. I mean, you can sort of think about why squaring things here might be similar to that because you know, voltage and current are related through Ohm's law and then um, the, the power is voltage times current. So you can think of think why these things might, might, might be squared. But really, it's, it's just a convention that's the most common way. So people typically refer to the magnitude of AC voltage in terms of this root mean squared value. Are there any questions? I haven't really asked that. I've just sort of been checking along. Are there any questions about any of this? Okay. Um, so there's also the, the corresponding symbols and for AC sources. So an AC source just looks like a DC source, but instead of a plus and minus, there's just a sine wave going through it. Um, and here would be, for example, an AC circuit. Usually when you write 120 volts like that, it means um, 120 volts RMS, though Quux actually has different notation there. I think Quux actually talks about the max voltage, so just know which one you're talking about. Um, and as you may expect, uh, Ohm's law holds just like it did for DC circuits for AC circuits. Right? So Ohm's law said that um, the voltage was equal to the current times the resistance, and for AC it just holds instantaneously at every time. So th this is vo uh, AC circuits with just resistive loads. Um, so this is saying is the voltage at time t is just equal to the current, or equivalently, if you want to do it this way, that's fine too. The current at time t is equal to the voltage at time t divided by the resistance. Uh, and that holds ins instantaneously at every point. Right? So if the voltage then is equal to this thing, V max times sine of omega t plus v, well then I, this would imply that I t would just equal v max over r times the sine of omega t plus v. Pretty simple, right? Um, and this is what that looks like in a plot uh, for some values of resistance and, and v max. I guess v max is 1 here, but resistance is whatever it needs to be. Um, and what this, look, look, this looks like is just what you expect exactly. You have one sine wave here, and then the, for the voltage, and then the current here is just the same sine wave, just 
scale differently, depending on this term right here, V max over R. And what the situation actually is, what's happening here is that in this situation, voltage and current are what are called in phase, because the phase angle of these things is the same. There's no difference. Now what gets interesting is when this is, we introduce other components into the circuits that actually change this. Uh, and that's what we're going to do now. So let's talk about two more types of components in an AC circuit, which will be inductors and capacitors. Inductors are elements that resist change in current. Um, and, and the simplest inductor is just a coil of wire. So you take a string of wire and you just coil it in a bunch of loops. This resists change in current. And what's happening at, at a fundamental level is that, um, though we won't, we're not getting into the sort of the physics of the magnetism here, but essentially the current through that wire induces a, a, a magnetic field through that loop that actually will resist change in current. So if, you, if, if current's flowing through it and you all of a sudden increase or decrease the voltage, it will actually resist that change. So it won't change instantaneously. It'll take a little bit of time for the sort of the current to, to do what it should do for this new voltage. And when you're doing something like AC, a, a, AC circuits where the voltage is always changing, this has very interesting behavior. Um, the unit of inductance is called the Henry, and that's just one second times one ohm. Um, but the really sort of way to understand inductors, I think, is through this law, which is essentially that the same thing as Ohm's law, just defining it for an inductor. So this is essentially Ohm's law, but it has to do with derivatives here instead of just uh, raw quantities. So what that is saying is that the voltage, actually I'll, I'll put it a different way, the derivative of the current is equal to the voltage uh, over the, this quantity L, which is the inductance. Um, and so a way to think, and then the, the symbol of this in, circle, uh, in circuits here are these little loops meant to indicate a loop of wire. Um, and one way to think about this, about what's, what's happening here, is to build actually a DC circuit. But we're not going to talk about it with DC much, but if you build a DC circuit like this um, and put an inductor here, by the way, don't do this because bad things will happen. Um, well, first of all, if you were to just have nothing here, and this, so there's no resistance, um, then actually, you know, in theory, you'd have infinite current flowing through the circuit, right? Because there's no resistance to resist the, the flow, um, and you have infinite current uh, because the resistance is zero, so you're dividing by zero to get the to get the current. Um, inductors, you can think of as something that's sort of like will 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 for a long enough time um, be like a cl uh, just a, a closed circuit piece of wire, but they take a little while to get there. Um, so we're not going to talk about inductors in DC circuits at all, except just introduce them. But what will happen here is suppose that at time zero, suppose you do this and you, you know, have a switch here and you turn the switch on. Uh, at time zero, there's no current flowing through. Um, and what will happen then is that the derivative of the current will equal V over L. So what that means is that so this will be the current and this will be time. What that means is this will just keep increasing like a linear function, right? Where the slope here is just going to be V over L is the slope. Okay? Eventually it'll reach the, you know, it'll become infinite just like in a case where you have a, a plain wire there. But it'll, it'll take a little time to get there. And what's very interesting, of course, is that when you have voltage that's always changing, this doesn't happen. You can actually do that. It's okay to hook up this with an, with an AC source here. Um, but, but for the DC source, you would just keep increasing current. DC voltage source, you would keep increasing current forever. Um, now let's look at what happens, though, in an AC circuit. And we're going to do this just by using, again, pretty basic calculus here. Um, so let's put this in this, let's hook up the circuit here, where we now have, instead of a DC source, we have an AC source, AC voltage source. All right, so remember the AC voltage source says that V equals VT equals Vmax, shouldn't erase that, times the sine of omega T plus V, okay? And the law for inductors said that the derivative of the current with respect to time times L equals V, which in this case is Vmax over sine 
omega t plus. Okay. Now to get an expression for what the volt uh, current actually is, not just an expression in terms of its derivative, we're just going to integrate both sides here. So we integrate both sides, and what we get is we get um, i t. We've integrated this one times l. So I'll just divide by l in a second. Uh, equals v max times the integral of this sine term. We'll make a t plus sigma dt. Uh, the, this is a really easy integral to compute, right? We know how to compute that. That's just the cosine. The integral of the sine is just going to be the cosine. So this equals. Uh, so I'll just write it as i t equals v max over l times over l times the cosine of omega t plus v. All right, and now I'm actually just going to say, okay, well, the cosine is the same function as the sine, just offset by a little bit, right? This is also equals v max over l times the sine of omega t plus phi minus pi over 2. All right, the cosine is just the sine where you shift over, essentially shifted, you know, added with, 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 with pi over 2 added to it. Sorry, sine um, with pi over, with, where you subtract, you know, take the input and subtract pi over 2 and that becomes the cosine. Um, so what this looks like from a picture standpoint, so, so interesting, you have the same kind of relationship here. Um, oh, sorry. There, 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 I'm sorry. There, there's an omega that comes out um, when you integrate. Sorry about that. That's important. No, no. Yeah, yeah. If you're, if you're differentiating, it would be the numerator. But if you're integrating, it would be the denominator. Um, that's important, actually. <laughs> this, this omega here. Um, a because it's right, and B because the scaling is actually very important here. Um, so what's happened here is that we're just doing kind of something very similar as we were before. We're taking the voltage, we're scaling it, and that equals the current, but we're also shifting it by 2 pi, which is 90 degrees, right? Sorry, not 2 pi, pi over 2. Um, what that looks like is this. So the blue here is the voltage, and the green line is the current. Um, I'm just plotting these equations right here. And what's happening here is that the green line is lagging behind the blue line by 90 degrees. Okay, it's important. Even though it looks like it's sort of shifted this way, what's really happening is it's lagging behind, right? Because when this is here, this is here. When this is here, this is just here. Here, it's yeah, et cetera. Oh, sorry, here, it's still at the top, et cetera. So this is sort of, you know, two pi behind where this guy was in terms of time. So what's really interesting about this, though, is that it's still, the current here is still a sine wave. It's just that using an inductor, we've shifted it over 90 degrees behind. Current is lagging the voltage by 90 degrees. Now we can do the same thing here with a capacitor. So capacitors are the other element we'll, we'll, we'll talk about now when we talk about AC circuits. Uh, and capacitors are something that intuitively sort of stores electric charge. Uh, the simplest, the, 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 the sort of constant to think of as a capacitor is these two metal plates, uh, rail close to each other. And what can happen is that negative charge, if you just attach two plates like this to, to, to a circuit, uh, positive charge will build up on one and negative charge will build up on the other. Because essentially, um, you know, this one's connected to the positive terminal, it's connected to the negative terminal, and so positive charge will build up here and negative charge will build up there. Um, and that's what the symbol looks like, by the way, too, is just, is just this two little plates close to each other. Um, really, there's a material di uh, dielectric, that's what it's called, right, between these two. But um, intuitively, it's just two plates that are going to, where one's going to build up charge of one kind and one's going to build up charge of the other kind. Um, Cassin's mission in farads, which is one second per ohm. But again, the, the real sort of way to think about capacitors is through their their definite or th their functional definition here, which is again like their version of Ohm's law, which is very similar to the inductor. Just the role of voltage and current are flipped here. So this is the derivative of voltage with respect to time equals the current. Um, the capacitor, or the inductor, was the opposite. It said that the derivative of current uh, was equal to the some, something times the voltage. 
And again, I think the uh, you know, exactly analogous drawing to what I showed before was if you somehow ha were to have a current source, a DC current source, then to a capacitor, um, and were to plot, and so assume there's no voltage drop over this thing at first, and you're maintaining a fixed current, well, the change in voltage will equal the current. So voltage, this is, so now I'm going to plot voltage, I'm going to plot time here. So again, just like with the inductor, build up current, this is just going to have to build up voltage. This one's a little less realistic because there aren't so many sort of natural current sources like that. But if you were to find a current source, attach it to a capacitor, what would happen is just keep building up voltage. Um, in order to keep driving current, you have to have a bigger and bigger voltage drop across that capacitor, essentially. Um, again, though, that's not really interesting here because, you know, you can think of it in the DC case, but really what's, what's interesting about this is when you talk about uh, capacitors in the AC setting. Um, so let's do the exact same thing we did before and just talk about what would happen in the AC case. So here again, um, we actually now have it a little bit easier. We can just directly plug in our, our uh, we don't have to integrate or anything, we can just take derivatives. Um, so we know that the current equals capacitance times the derivative of the voltage. So this would be d dt sine omega t plus phi. And this time the, uh, the omega would come out in the, in the numerator. So this will, uh, uh, sorry, I looked at a Vmax here. So this is C Vmax. Okay, and now let's just differentiate this. This is just going to be equal to um, C Vmax uh, negative. Well, actually, I'm not going to write the negative here. What I'm actually going to write is, sorry, it's not, it's not negative, it's just the cosine. Cosine of omega t plus v. Um, wait, did I get my signs mixed up in one of the things? No, I don't think so. That should be fine, right? Okay, um, this equals to c times v max cosine of this thing, which equals, uh, again, we're just going to play our tricks like we did before. Oh, sorry, there's an omega here. Yes, I, I, I did get this. The, I, think, I think I left that a negative sign when I wrote the thing, because the, sorry, the derivative of the cosine is the negative sine, um, and the derivative of the sine is the cosine. So, sorry, when I was running on the board before, I left out a negative sign. That's, that, that, that is important, that's why we got a negative 2 pi here. Um, to yell out when I make mistakes like that. If anyone saw it. I guess now it's recorded forever, so you'll all see it again. Um, okay, so <laughs> I thought something was funny there, because now we were doing it the same way and getting the same thing. The derivative of the sine equals the cosine with no sign change. Um, you pull out an omega here too because you multiply omega by t inside that thing. Um, and this now, without the negative sign there, what you get is the reverse of what we had before. So this equals uh, c times omega v max times the sine of omega t plus v plus pi over 2. Okay? So, What's happening is that just like with an inductor in an AC circuit, if you just hook up an AC circuit to a capacitor, uh, that's fine. First of all, you know, current will flow through this thing. And what'll happen is that the, just like the inductor caused the current to lag behind the voltage by 90 degrees, a capacitor will cause the current to lead the voltage by 90 degrees. So the voltage, current rather, is always 90 degrees ahead of where the voltage is. Right? And like before, you have the capacitance times omega being your sort of times V max, but sort of the, the scaling you get from the capacitor itself, the capacitance times omega. This also tells a little bit about the relative scaling of capacitors and inductors versus resistors. So for resistors, remember, this was just the res, you know, Vmax over the resistance, essentially. Um, it was the resistance itself that was the scaling factor between these two things. For capacitors and inductors, it is the capacitance or the inductance times the frequency omega. So for, and, and for AC systems, this is about you know, 300 something for 2 pi times 60, for 60 hertz. So you know, the, the effective scaling you're getting for these things is 300 times the capacitance. So 
think of that relative scaling when you talk when, when you think about um, the relative scalings of resistors and capacitors, there's, there's going to be a big difference in sort of the, the values you typically see in those things. Um, and similarly for inductors too. Um, and by the way, that, that, that difference would be a lot, is, is a lot bigger when you talk about higher frequency stuff, right? So that if this is even higher frequency, um, you're going to need a you know, very, very small uh, farad measurements or, or Henry measurements for a capacitor or inductor. That's what you see. I mean, people talk about you know, picofarads and, and microfarads. You never talk about micro-ohms because it would, be, it would be silly. I mean, that's, that's, that's basically just a wire, right? Um, so, so that's probably that's just something to keep in mind about why you see vastly different scaling in terms of capacitors, inductors, and, and resistors. Um, okay, so now, well, this is all great. We've sort of given laws for how capacitors and inductors work in AC circuits. Um, it gets, it, as you imagine, it would get pretty tedious if you had to constantly write things like the sine omega t plus phi, all these kind of quantities that don't really matter to us, but uh, we have to write, you know, sine of this, sine of that. And the other thing is that it's sort of hard to see exactly why this is all linear still, right? Um, I, I call these all linear circuits. I'm saying they're all related by linear laws, yet you have clearly nonlinear functions here. So, so how do you actually express and work with linear systems, or sorry, with, with, with AC systems in a linear fashion? And what we're going to do to solve this is we're going to note that first of all, um, voltages and currents, if they're all sinusoidal, can be expressed entirely in terms of their magnitude and their phase angle. Right? We don't need to actually, we don't actually care that it's a sine wave, you know, sine wave here. Uh, we'll assume that uh, the, the omega was constant for everything, so we'll assume the frequency is constant across the whole circuit. What it actually is doesn't matter for the scalings here, but we'll, we'll sort of, we don't need to include it when we talk about writing the equation there, because sinusoids for a given frequency are expressed entirely in terms, just in terms of their voltage magnitude here and their phase angle. So, you know, this is a sinusoid with this whole thing as its magnitude and this whole thing as its phase angle. Uh, and this is a sinusoid with this thing as its magnitude and this whole thing as a, or this thing as its phase angle. So, the way we're going to use these things then, or, or represent these things, is using complex numbers. Rather than sort of going through the, the tedium of writing sine, every, uh, sine, cosine, etc., we're just going to use complex numbers to represent these quantities. Who here has actually done complex, you know, done manipulations of, of, of AC circuits with using complex numbers before? Okay, so, so everyone's seen complex numbers before, right? Okay. Um, we'll have a quick rehash on that, but if you haven't seen them before, then you certainly want to brush up, but I think, I think everyone's seen them before. Um, so the basic point here, is that we can express the voltage and current in terms of complex, what are called complex exponentials. Right? So we can actually write the voltage rather than in terms of um, you know, the sine. We just can write the voltage as being, this is equal to the, say, the real portion of V max times E to the J omega t plus v, um, where e to the j to the j phi equals cosine of phi plus j. j here is the imaginary unit I'm using. Again, I can't use i because we already took that for current, so engineers use j, uh, times j plus the sine of phi. Um, here we're using cosines and sines as the basic sort of function for, for what the form of the voltage takes. But it's, it really doesn't matter if you use cosines or sines because everything's synchronized to the sort of base phase angle and the cosines and sines shifted by a little bit. So um, you can ignore the fact that you actually would have here, for example, the, the voltage at time zero would be equal to um, just the cosine of, of that thing. Okay, um, and so actually for convenience um, will actually represent the entire quantity of voltage just as this complex quantity rather than just the real portion. So here I'm saying it's just equal to the real portion of this, but what we'll actually do is represent the voltage using the entire complex quantity itself. 
So not just the real portion here, but this whole thing. And we'll even, typically, uh, we can actually even ignore t altogether, ignore time altogether, because we're worried about steady state analysis here. We don't really care what happens every second. We just want to know what happens, you know, in, on, not really on average, but what the steady state phase difference is, for example. So we'll actually just ignore time as well. We won't worry about time, and we'll just represent voltage in terms of um, its, its uh, voltage magnitude and the phase angle. So we'll basically treat this as being not, it's still there, it has to still be there, but just we just don't worry about what it is. We just sort of ignore that and call voltage um, equal to V max times E. I won't write Vt now. What I'll actually just write is that we would just represent the voltage being equal to V max times E to the J V. This is a single complex number that we use to represent voltage. Okay. So the nice thing about this representation here is it gives us very nice ways of representing very simple laws for decoration capacitors that don't actually involve even sines or cosines. They just involve um, the, the raw expressions themselves. So for example, um, The equivalent, and these are really all meant to look very similar to Ohm's law. So the equivalent, the, the, the statement of um, an inductor, remember, was that I equals L times the derivative of voltage over derivative of time. Sorry, that's the backwards. <laughs> Wait, yes, that is backwards, right? Um, v equals the I. That's the inductor statement, right? Okay, to make sure I'm right. <laughs> um, so what we can actually do is just take derivatives of the complex expression itself. So I here, I'm actually going to write big I. I here is going to be equal to, um, I'll just write it sort of I max, the maximum current times E to the J uh, omega, omega T plus V. Right, so let's just differentiate that thing with respect to T now. What we get is that V equals L times, well, we get a J and an omega out of here. So we get J omega. Um, but then it's just this, the same thing here times, because the, the derivative of the, of the exponential is just the derivative of this thing times the exponential times I max E to the J omega T uh, plus v, which is equal to j l omega i, because this thing is just the same as i. So this notation gives us very succinct ways of expressing uh, the, the, the Ohm's law for inductors and for capacitors. Right? And if you do the same thing for a capacitor, you get this equation here. The voltage equals this thing. Um, there's a negative sign here because when you divide by j, you get you, you, you invert the sign of it, too. Um, but you might want to actually just go ahead and check to make sure you get that same thing when you do the derivatives there. OK, so, so first of all, some, some simple rules now regarding complex numbers. Um, I'll blaze through this kind of because I think people have at least seen this before. Uh, some notation, though, the x bar is, so first of all, x Complex numbers can be represented as having a real part and an imaginary part. So I'll represent x as a plus j times b, and y is another complex number, which is c plus j times d. Um, the complex conjugate of x, which is or of any complex number, which is denoted as x bar, um, that equals just the real part with the sign and the imaginary part flipped. Just the definition of what the complex conjugate is. Uh, actually, in a previous version of these notes, I wrote x star. So you might have a version of those where you, where you see that actually. That's also used uh, to denote conjugates. That's a little tricky though because um, I decided to actually change this in, in, in the notes in general because um, this actually also refers to the, com the, the conjugate transpose of a matrix. So if you have a matrix with complex values and you write something like A star, 
that usually means that you conjugate all the elements of A and also transpose it. Whereas A bar just is the complex conjugate. So I'm going to use bar for the conjugate and star for the conjugate transpose. So we actually don't use the conjugate transpose very much in this course. Okay, so you have the conjugate transpose. You can add them. Adding them just adds the real parts and their imaginary parts. At least very simple. You can multiply them. Multiplying them, um, all you do is you actually just distribute out the multiplication like that. And what you see is that you're going to have the parts where you multiply the two of the imaginary components together. Those are going to, the j's are going to cancel and become negative one. So you're going to have a times, uh, it should be a times c. Yeah, it should be a times c. Sorry, that's the, that's the typo there. So <laughs> I should write it then. a plus jb times c plus jd. Uh, that way, they, these two real parts, you have ac minus bd. Um, and then you have the two imaginary parts, which is this times this plus this times this. So plus j times b times c plus uh, a times d. Was it completely wrong? No, just that, yeah, just that first bit. Just that a, b there. Should be an a, c. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes, sorry. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, you can also do things like divide by things, but division is actually a little trickier. The best way to think about division really is actually think about 1 over this thing being the quantity you need to multiply by x in order to get 1. So the inverse of x here is this quantity here. And you can actually just, it's not that easy to, to, to just see that intuitively. Other, I think the best way to see it is just multiply this by x using that formula there, and you'll get 1. Assuming everything's correct in the notation. I th <laughs> hopefully that one is. Uh, actually, no, it would be, um, yeah, yeah, that, that would be right, because there's only A and B there. Um, OK, so that, that one looks good. And then division is just multiplication by the inverse. So the way you, you divide x by y is you take the inverse of y and multiply that by x. Um, now, it's very going to be very useful for our, in our case, we actually already started doing this a little bit, to represent complex numbers in what's called polar form. So this one up here, something's called the rectangular representation of complex numbers. You explicitly represent the real and the imaginary part. Um, a sometimes better way of representing them is through polar form. And what you do there is you represent it as a complex exponential, where you represent the magnitude and the angle of, of this thing. And what that corresponds to is actually a drawing like this, where this is A, and this is B. A is the sort of the X axis and the, and the real axis, and B is the imaginary axis. Um, the equivalent statement, R equals J times theta, and you can kind of get this just by looking at the definition of that, being in terms of the sines and the cosines, um, would be to say that R would be the radius of this vector here, how far it is from the origin this point here. And then uh, I'm using theta now for the angle, but theta would be the angle away from the, the, the x-axis, the real axis. OK? Um, and of course, you can convert between the two, right? So r here would just be a, the square root of a squared plus b squared. Um, and theta would be, to say, the, the inverse tan of b over a. It also could be the inverse cosine of you know, b over r, or stuff like that. Um, but you can convert between the two, back and forth, right? Now. The reason why you want to do this oftentimes um, is that multiplication, so addition up there in rectangular form was easy, right? We just added the corresponding parts. But multiplication is a little harder. Division is kind of very annoying, right? It's a lot of different terms. Um, in polar form, it's much easier to multiply and add things. So, boy, this slide is just full of air. I really need to, need to fix this thing here. This should be R2 here. <laughs> this should be R2. Um, and this should be, this, should be, this should be R1 and theta, theta, R2 and theta 2. And this should be R2 and theta 2. Um, but in polar form, addition and division are much easier. Uh, and this actually is, is sort of, it follows exactly the rules of exponentiation, for example. Um, but when you take an exponential, so I'll write this in the next point just to make it a little clearer why this may be the case. But R1 
e to the j theta 1 times r2 e j theta 2. Well, in exponentiation, to add, to multiply two exponentials, you just add their exponents, right? So this would just be equal to r1 times r2 e to the j of theta 1 plus theta 2, right? And similarly, to divide exponentials, you just subtract the corresponding elements in the exponential. So r1 e j 1 over r2 e to the j theta 2 would just be equal to r1 over r2 times e to the j of theta 1 minus theta 2. Okay? And so this is sort of why, especially for us since we care so much about um, you know, the, the phase angles and the differences in phase angles, this kind of stuff, uh, it's very useful to represent the, the quantities that we're talking about here in their polar form rather than their, their real or rectangular form. Um, so I wanted to get, let's see, yeah, maybe I'll just finish this up and then we'll pick up here from next time. Um, so putting all of this together, remember we had all these rules for how voltage and current are related given resistors, capacitors, inductors, but these were really all of the same form, right? They were all of the form, um, you know, you had V equals R times I, and you have V equals L omega times, uh, yes, L omega times I, J times, that's what I was forgetting, well, no I was forgetting a term there, <laughs> equals imaginary times this, and, and then you also had uh, V equals negative J over C omega times I for a capacitor. So you had these rules for inductors, for resistors, inductors, and capacitors, and they're all the exact same form. Right? So what people typically do is rather than thinking about resistance, inductance, capacitance all separately, they just combine them into one quantity, which we call the induct impedance. Sorry, getting all my terms confused here. We call the, the complex impedance. So we'll combine all these things to one quantity z, which is going to be the sum of this thing, plus j times L omega minus 1 over capacitance uh, times that. And now we just say that V equals Z times I. Okay, we've essentially combined the laws for inductors, capacitors all into one, inductors, capacitors, and resistors all into one equation. And so really this is the quantity that tells us how voltage and current are related. And this is what will, for a resistor, it will leave these two things in phase. It will leave the phases the same. For a capacitor, because you're multiplying with a J here, it will actually, it will shift them. If it was just a capacitor, it would just make it cause it to leave by 90 degrees. If it was just an inductor, it would cause it to lag by 90 degrees. Um, but what's very cool here is that you actually combine all of these things together, and you get things that shift, you know, the absolute, that scale the absolute current that shift by phase angles that are not 90 degrees, um, that have shift different amounts, and so that actually, um, all that sort of complexity can be encapsulated by this one quantity, which is the impedance here. Yeah? So, if you don't have an inductor of a conductor, then it's going to be zero. Right, these will all be zero. Um, so, what, actually, right, so, this, so, so the thing is, when this is this is actually infinite here. Um, so it's a little tricky, uh, but, but it actually doesn't matter, right, right? So, so if this is zero, then just think of this part here being zero. It doesn't actually matter. Um, but actually, so just sort of, sort of ignore this part here a little bit. Um, the, yeah, so, so the inductance of a wire is typically, actually, is this, is this correct? The inductance of a wire would be zero, but the capacitance of a wire actually would be, um, would it, it would be infinite, or would it be? You know, let, me, let me get back to that, but basically, yes. Uh, if you just have resistors, it is, it, the, the, the resistance is the only thing that matters here, and so you just ignore this whole part here. Uh, it doesn't matter. Um, if you have capacitors or inductors, though, you plug these into the equation, and you'll get some term which has both real and imaginary parts. So when it's just imaginary, you just shift 
the, the, um, you just shift the current or voltage by 90 degrees, one way or the other. Um, but when this is some other set of values, you would actually um, you know, have, some, have some interesting uh, sort of different combination that would do kind of interesting things that aren't quite, that aren't quite full capacitance or full inductance or full resistance. And this lets us find the steady state solutions for AC circuits without thinking about cosines or sines, with just thinking about these complex quantities. Okay, so let me actually stop there um, and talk about the homework. And, but the next homework and the project and all that kind of stuff. So, okay. Um, so a bunch of deadlines we have, I guess. Uh, first of all, the next homework, homework two, posted on the website now. You have, we have not yet covered everything we need to know. We'll finish covering things for the, for the last question. Um, you will need to know stuff we cover next time when we talk about uh, power systems and three-phase power and this kind of stuff. But um, we'll talk about that next time. And um, that one is going to be due two weeks from today. So due in two weeks. The project, so the, the project, um, so guidelines are up on the website now on the assignments part, the same as what we had before, same as the problem sets. Um, and the proposal, which is a short proposal, <laughs> this is not intended as a big thing, it's intended to sort of get you thinking about it. You can change it afterwards, so don't worry about that, but do put some effort into it. Um, it's 500 words, so we're talking about basically a, a quick write-up of what you want to do. Uh, that's going to do a week from Thursday, which I believe is the uh, 10, 18th? A week from Thursday, I think? Is that right? The 17th. That's right, right, because yeah, I think a week from Thursday is the 17th. Um, it's going to do a week from this Thursday. Again, that's fairly short, so submit something, but, but it's more of a chance to just sort of start thinking about this and make sure you're on the right track rather than intended to sort of have a final, here is what we're doing. Um, the milestone is going to be due on, <laughs> what was it, 18th November I said? 14th, 14th did I say? Number 14th. And that essentially should be, that's sort of halfway between the initial assignment, the proposal and the final deadline. Um, so it's intended, as you might imagine, as, you know, should be about halfway there. Have about half your stuff and have a few results, have a few uh, discussions related to work, things like that. And then the final, um, final report is going to be on the 12th. And it's due at midnight on that day. Uh, these two things you can use late days for. I wouldn't recommend it because you know, you're going to be mainly graded on this last thing. This is just sort of check-ins. It's more important that you submit something and you don't completely blow it off, but put in a reasonable effort. But you're not going to be graded that heavily on either of these. Um, but this one you can't use late days for. Just the semester's about to end there. I need to be able to get the grades all in time and get them back to you with comments. So um, please, please get that in on time. I mean, not just please, but you will actually lose points if you submit in late. So do not do, not do that. Um, let's see. What were the last things? Um, Homework due, solutions are out, the passwords are there for those that want to access that. Um, and then finally I have your things to turn back, but let me turn off the camera.